Hello there, and welcome to the Canadian Philosophy Show. I'm your host for today, Hale Rothery, and today we will we're, we will be discussing um, the subjective features of consciousness. We'll be looking at several difficulties posed by consciousness, such as the mind-body problem, uh, facts beyond the reach of human concepts, the limits of objecti objectivity and issues of reductionism, the phenomenological features of subjective experience, and, in tune with that, what it is like to be a particular conscious being. Our main sources for today are Thomas Nagel's 1974 paper, What It Is Like to Be a Bat, and we will also be looking at some thoughts and concepts presented by the modern philosopher of mind, David Chalmers. And for those of you listening, we are uh, live on CJSF 90.1 FM radio out of SFU and Chile 101.7 FM um, out of VIU, or you might be listening to us on various streaming services. So with that, um, why don't we get into today's uh, very interesting and heady topic. That's my bad joke. Um, to kind of talk about particular consciousness and in particular the subjective features of consciousness. So to kind of intro on what that means. So that within the discussions around the philosophy of consciousness, consciousness and neuroscience, um, there's obviously the physicalist scientific like what we might call traditionally scientific side of, of looking at the physical processes of the brain and how those correlate with brain states and behaviors. But there's also another side that's been brought up by philosophers like Nagel and Chalmers, which is that consciousness as to what it is seems to have a qualitative um, element that really can't be or shouldn't be ignored um, according to, to uh, people like Nagel and, and Chalmers. Um, and what we mean by qualitative is the fact that, to put it as simple as possible, for any conscious being, there is something that it is like to be that being. Hmm. There is some sort of quality, some sort of experience to be that thing um, that's, that we seem to struggle to understand through physical... Um, at least our our current methods of of physical um, exploration and, and theories of physicalism. So with that, I'll I'll open up the floor to our panel and I'll maybe let all our, our my co-hosts um, introduce themselves as well. And whoever would like to go first, jump right in. I'm sure everybody has firsthand experience with this topic. <laughs> Wow. Hail. Okay. So my name's Tegan Marshall. I am uh, going into, let's hope, my third year at uh, Vancouver Island University. Um, yeah, when I, I started to look at, you know, what is it to be a bat, right? The first thing that jumped to me is, and we can talk about this more as we get on to it, right? But Heidegger's emphasis, you know, I got to bring Heidegger into this because he's my, he's my guy. <laughs> and, uh, but Heidegger's emphasis in being in time in particular, right? Of the individuation of someone's world, right? That is not something you can objectively experience. That's something you can only begin to understand when you fully step in with that person through relationship and through communication to to understand right so i think there's some similarities there that unless you strive to enter into that person's world that person's conception of what it means to be them your understanding and therefore maybe even your emotional attachment will be limited Thanks for bringing that up today. And I think that's, I think a, a certain kind of individuation is something that, that uh, is at the heart of a lot of these subjective theories that focus on the subjective features of consciousness for sure. I'll jump in then. Uh, my name is Michael Robert Kaditz. I'm an alumnus of Vancouver Island University. And I think I'm going to, you know, um, jump in right at the starting gate here and give my 
really brief synopsis of my view about Nagel in advance, and then uh, we'll see what happens later also. But I've, I've read a lot of Nagel, and in my view, Nagel has an agenda, which is to refute physicalism, um, re refute a um, purely physical or scientific explanation for human consciousness. He doesn't go quite as far as to argue for a uh, you know, a, a dualism, a Cartesian type dualism, but I think the implication is there. And uh, I think when Nagel talks about what it's like to be a bat and talks about the qualitative experience that living things have or humans have and animals pro likely have, I think he's stating the obvious. I think most of us accept and understand that we have conscious qualitative experiences that we feel pain and pleasure and we feel emotions and feel beauty and have love and anger and all those things. I don't think that's in dispute. So I think Nagel is uh, making a big effort to state the obvious, but I think what's not obvious and what doesn't follow from that, what does not follow from the fact that we have qualitative experiences is that there's something non-physical that constitutes those experiences. So again, Nagel doesn't go all the way in explicitly arguing for immaterial substance, but he does suggest, as you stated in your in your intro introduction, Hale, that physicalism has a tough time explaining qualitative experiences, and so maybe it does. So maybe we don't understand fully the physical workings of the brain. We don't. It's a very complex physical apparatus. But just because we don't understand yet, that the scientists or neuroscientists don't understand exactly how consciousness arises from a physical brain, it does not follow that there's an immaterial substance, that there's something immaterial, there's a, there's a, there's a mysterious, um, you know, unexplainable immaterial uh, soul or spirit or, or, or you know, some, uh, some other substance that constitutes human consciousness, because I think that would even be harder to understand. So even though we don't fully understand how a physical brain can lead to an emergence of consciousness, we certainly don't understand how there could be some immaterial substance that explains consciousness. So that's that's what I wanted to say is that that merely merely um, showing how bats or other living things have qualitative experiences, it does not go, it can, it cannot be used, you cannot use that argument to say that physicalism is wrong or that there's something more to a human brain than the physical, its con physical constituents. Thanks. Thank you, Mikey. Um, so I guess for our introductions, my name is Nicole Kerrigan. I'm a third going to fourth year um, psychology and philosophy student at Simon Fraser University. Um, unlike my co-hosts here, um, I didn't face Nagel's paper in any of my classes yet. I probably will at some point, but I got past it maybe out of mere luck or mere chance at this point. But I'm really happy to have had exposure to Nagel's paper for this show. Um, and I'm coming probably to this show with the most fresh perspective on it because I haven't been exposed to it beforehand. and I haven't taken classes in consciousness. So I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, and I guess to Go on, go on and comment on um, Michael's points here. Uh, my understanding of Nagel's arguments is definitely that he's making a commentary on physicalism, which is very much so the dominant view in the philosophy of science right now that you can reduce, um, you know, phenomena to like the physical physical components. Like you know, um, for example, with a with a lightning strike, um, it's not, the lightning strike can be reduced to its I guess, physical components of what actually occurs when the lightning strike happens. So that's one example of it. Um, my understanding too, with um, physicalism here is not that Nagel is completely saying that there's no role for physicalism, but I think he's suggesting that there's parts of physicalism may be wrong or inconsistent with our subject subjective experience. So our subjective experience, you know, for example, if we're having pain, we are experiencing pain, right? But nobody else can actually experience the pain that you are experiencing at that point. That doesn't mean that the pain that you're experiencing isn't true or isn't actually happening just because you can't objectively define it 
outside of it, you can try to try to define it in a scale of one to 10, or, you know, say, is your pain dull or sharp, they'll never actually get at the phenomena of what you're what you're subjectively experiencing with that pain. Um, one thing that Nagel suggests here, I believe, and I could be I could be wrong, so correct me if I am, but is that in order to have subjective conscious experiences, it's inconsistent to say that I think the the sum of all the parts are like not non-conscious as well. I think he goes as far to suggest that each like organ in our body and each cell also has a conscious experience in order to make the sum of like the total sum of the experience conscious. I could have misinterpreted that, but that's what I got from the paper. So I think from that, he would be saying that um, physicalism isn't necessarily wrong, but maybe that it's missing a part of like how we can actually get to consciousness and understanding it in those terms. Oh, thanks. Thanks both you guys for, for a view. I, I will say like, you guys have both brought up a lot of really interesting stuff and I'll say at least from my reading, um, you're kind of talking about a, pan, like, a sort of like panpsychism, Nicole, which I, I'll just say personally, I don't remember that could be missing it somewhere, but I, I personally remember it. But um, Mikey, I'm, I'm thinking too about like what you were saying. And, and I think one of the big things to remember with Nagel and, and people on this sort of this kind of fence is that side of the, this, uh, my words stumbled there. This side of the fence of philosophy of mind is that there's a real focus on consciousness and basically the claim and I, I know that sounds like, what are we talking about there? But, you know, what we might call experience, what we might call the phenomenal character, the qualia, um, you know, quote, quote unquote, what it is like. So for all of us sitting here listening, um, there's something that it's like to be sitting here listening, discussing, looking around, having all our sensory senses and all that kind of stuff. And that's dependent. I don't think Nagel's making the claim that like, I don't even think I'm Daniel is definitely not making the claim that the brain is not the origins of consciousness. I think from my reading, the claim is a little more, um, what's the word I'm looking for unique than that, which is that one thing he kind of hints at is that perhaps the way the human mind is set up and which leads to the way in which we do science and understand the world and all this stuff, perhaps we are not the kind of beings that are equipped to, to jump the gap between the objective and the subjective because the conscious experience part of mind is by its very definition subjective and the second we try to reduce that out to something that is understandable outside of that particular experience or outside of a particular type of experience um, we then run into the problem of making the subject of object of, and then it loses that quality that made it what it was, is, a, is, is from my understanding, a very key part of, of Nagel's, Nagel's argument. And so perhaps on, on his account, we, it's just not something we can do. That doesn't mean it's not physical, though, that it doesn't have some sort of physical origin. I think Haley, oh. Oh, oh, go, go ahead, David. Okay. All right, uh, to introduce myself, I'm David Pham from Simon Fraser University. I'm a fifth year computing science and statistics major. I would also agree with Hale um, and kind of maybe push back a little on Mikey and some of Nicole's points in saying that I would say from my interpretation of Nagel's paper here, he's not... Um, saying that physicalism is wrong per se or that there is like a cartesian dualism i would say that he's simply arguing that with subjective experience subjective or um yeah with subjective experience there needs to be if physical if physicalism is to be right right then Physicalism must explain subjective experience as well. And I think his point is that most physicalist arguments kind of ignore this subjective component to consciousness, to experience. And to make, he also makes the claim that, um, I guess, like, 
if we were to reduce, we can't really reduce consciousness to other things necessarily the same way that we can kind of reduce maybe other phenomena because what consciousness is or what subjective experience is, is what it's like to be that thing or to experience that thing. And if you take that out, if you take out what it's like to be that thing, then then conscious like what is the consciousness of a bat if you kind of remove what it's like to be a bat like can you reduce it to anything else i think that's kind of his main argument that it needs to be accounted for and it also cannot really be reduced to something else and um to nicole's point about i guess like panpsychism or like uh, each component must be conscious or the sum of the parts need to be conscious as well to create something conscious. I don't think he is necessarily making that claim at all, but simply that in order to really, you can't, I guess, know what it's like to be a bat unless you are a bat, but it's possible to, I guess, like approximate what it's like to be a bat. I'm not, I'm not sure if he kind of like, talks about mechanisms of consciousness at all simply the subjective part of it yeah thanks david and i think um one sort of way of phrasing it uh comes to my mind which is that um physicalism or any sort of science really and, I, and again i want to stress that i don't think nagel is 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 anti-science but any sort of any sort of science is looking to explain things from a view from nowhere. And what I mean by that is that um, it's looking to explain things through universal concepts and understandings that can be understood by any rational being anywhere, anytime, really. Um, but the thing is, is that consciousness is always a view from somewhere or someone, someone and someone really. Um, and then this becomes problematic if we try if we try and take that and understand that view that view from somewhere as a as a view from nowhere, we we, we end up and in a sense Nagel sort of says that that physicalist theories reduce out the qualitative aspect of consciousness, um, which he, at least he purports to seem to be very very important. What else is consciousness but you know what it is to be something. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I want to be the defender of physicalism uh, here, and uh, without without trying to evaluate Nagel's view, um, I just want to defend physicalism from various attacks and implications and suggestions. Um, so I, I don't think physicalism should be straw manned. For example, physicalism does not deny qualitative experiences unless you're in the particular genre of uh, physicalism, which is called eliminative materialism. In that very niche uh, belief system, uh, there is a denial of qualitative experiences, but that's a very minority view. It's not subscribed to by many physicalists. It's been mostly debunked, right? Although there are some, there's still some people who believe that. But for the most part, physicalism does not de deny qualitative experiences. Uh, also, all physicalism is not reductionist. There are, in fact, reductionism is, is is uh, not the most popular theory of physicalism. What's more uh, contemporary now in in our understanding of physicalism is that um, is what's called either emergence or functionalism. So, if, or an emergent view, which is that consciousness and qualitative experiences uh, emerge from the physical brain, and another view is functionalism, which is that parts of the brain serve certain functions, including qualitative experiences. Without, without getting into detail, though, I just wanted to point out that uh, it's important not to straw man physicalism um, uh, because it does not deny uh, qualitative experiences. So I, 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 I just want to give one quick example of a thought experiment called Mary the Colorblind Scientist, so, which illustrates my point. So as the, uh, the thought experiment goes, Mary knows everything there is to know about a human brain. She knows every physical characteristic and piece and component of a human brain. Uh, 
but she's colorblind, and so she has never actually seen colors. So she understands how the brain works, but she doesn't know what the qualitative experience is like of seeing living colors. She sees everything in black and white, even though she knows everything about the brain from a scientific standpoint. So one day she has some surgery and wakes up and can see colors, and she has a new experience. All of a sudden, she has this qualitative experience of red and blue and green, and the world comes to, comes to life. So this thought experiment it was developed to argue against physicalism. It was to argue that, that Mary discovered something that couldn't be explained physically because she knew everything there was to know about the physical brain. And then when she all of a sudden had could see colors and had these new qualitative experiences, something new, she learned something new, which, which were, the, were, were these qualitative experiences. Therefore, it follows, according to this logic, that the qualitative experiences she had must not have been physical. Well, the problem with that argument is, and I'll, the response to that argument, is that she did not learn something new about the brain when she suddenly could see colors. She simply experience what she already knew in a different way and that different way was the first person qualitative experience of seeing color so so there was nothing new there was nothing non-physical it was just she experienced the same stuff she already knew about in the physical brain in a different way and that is the qualitative first person experience that physicalism accounts for so you know, I can argue that the physical brain is nothing more than its physical constituents, nothing more than physical constituents, but to the first person, to the one who has the brain, that person has a unique way of experiencing uh, the physical uh, the physical brain, and that is what we call, you know, uh, consciousness and qualitative experiences. I have a question for Mikey, if I could, for a second. So you say that she 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 knew it, she just experienced it, but how do you know she really knew it? Because isn't part of knowing something to some extent experience? Well, the the thought experiment postulates you know, so that the uh, you know the hypothesis for the sake of argument is that she knew everything there was possibly to knew about know about the physical brain. She, you know, she she knew the you know, from a scientific standpoint. She she did an inventory of the physical constituents of the brain and knew knew how everything worked, but she didn't actually have the first person experience of of seeing uh, of the qualitative experience of colors until she had an operation and could then see colors. So the question is, when she saw colors for the first time and had the qualitative experience of seeing greens and reds and blues, um, did she learn something new? Or did she simply experience what she already knew about the brain? Was she experiencing the same physical brain that she already knew how it worked physically, but experienced it in a different way? Yeah, I think, Mikey, I, I, in some ways I, I'm, I'm very um, sympathetic and I, and I find myself in, in a kind of middle, middle ground because I certainly, um, and I think to... For our listeners, we also looked at a little bit of David Chalmers, who um, well, I should probably say this as an aside that the Nagel paper is quite short um, and it really doesn't get into too much detail in some areas. And he makes some suggestions uh, later on about some stuff about how to kind of, kind of move forward with understanding consciousness. But it's really it's really quite brief. Um, and Chalmers is is really the a, the person who in the more last 10 or 20 years has really taken up. The philosophy of mind and this sort of the, this side of the discussion, what he kind of turns into what, what is called the hard problem of consciousness. There's many different aspects of that, but one of them, one important point to note is that neither of these people, and particularly Chalmers, uh, deny that uh, consciousness has physical origins in the mind. There's certainly no positing of any sort of um, second order substance that is like the conscious substance or whatever. The issue, though, becomes that while 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 conscious states the actual what it is like what it is like to be something, or the phenomenal states, or the qualia, whatever you want to call it, while those certainly have correlates or perhaps origins in physical states, the physical el physicalism itself or physical ways of describing things have a really hard time accounting for the qualitative experience, which is kind of what we were talking about earlier which is that you sort of hit a brick wall of being like, okay, well, 
um, yeah, obviously, like my mind, my consciousness, I'm rolling around. Obviously, that's physical, right? Obviously, it has physical origins in my mind. I would agree with that. But the way in which we would describe, understand, cash out what it is to be conscious in this, in that very particular way, um, because there are other elements of consciousness as well, or or the mind, um, is becomes very challenging to describe in and of itself outside of its, you might say, its physical origins or correlates. I would uh, add on to what Mikey and Hill are saying in that. I guess like uh, Mary, the colorblind scientist, this thought experiment is kind of used to argue for an epiphenomenal position, I guess, stating that there are, I guess there's more types of information than just physical, I guess, to summarize it. But um, some details that were left out were that Mary knew everything about color, knew everything about how color worked in the brain or how, and eyes and knew everything about how uh, humans perceive color, but was colorblind. So then the experiment kind of like, I guess, brings out two kinds of people when um, Mary is able to see color, finally, in that people who believe she learned something new and people who believe that, I guess, she did not learn something new. And if, if you believe that she learned something new in her experience of color or that, um, yeah, then I guess you would be somewhat an epiphenomenalist or at least believing in qualia in that, well, something that physical, I guess like um, to extrapolate, people have extrapolated the Mary, the colorblind scientist thought experiment. And they say that this like experience of seeing color qualia, right? there's no way to verify whether my qualia or your qualia are the same. So like my experience of red and your experience of red, right? What if there's no way to verify that red looks the same to me as it does to you, simply that we can verify that I see some set of colors that are different from like, I can delineate red from orange from green and you can also delineate red from orange from green and all these other colors. And we can delineate them and we might be able to like, you know, both perceive these colors, but how do we really know if we're seeing the same thing? Even if we observe like physically our, our brain states, everything there is to know about the physical information and our brain and the state of our brain, like, I guess it doesn't really tell us the contents of our experience or, um, yeah. But 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 actually, um, neur neuroscientists are beginning to to uh, to discover uh, to discover uh, ways of uh, you know imaging uh, a brain and, and and looking at brain waves and um, brain functions through through um, instruments that do correlate with what people describe as qualitative experiences. Uh, people, you know, they can, I mean, the most crude example would be like, you know, like lie detector tests, right? So, um, there are ways that, uh, that are, that are being, you know, um, developed, uh, it's a slow process and it's a technology that takes a long time to develop, but, uh, there, there, there are certain emotional experiences, you know, anxiety and lying or not lying and things like that, that, that actually do show up on a, on a screen. And can be can be measured scientifically. So um, one could argue. I, let me just finish. So one could argue that uh, that a first person experience is, is just another way of describing uh, something that a neurologist could could also see on a um, uh, uh, using um, instruments. Go ahead, Nicole. Um, so Michael, I I would um, request that you use a different example or try to come up with a different example because a lie detector test isn't a very good example at all because they're shown to really not be that accurate at all. They're not scientific and um, they're not used in a court of law for that reason. Um, and I believe I, I can't I can't remember the exact statistic. I can I'm gonna Google it right now, but I I don't think that they are that much more accurate if at all than like guessing and not mm. using a lie detector test so it's there's there is um, a lot of issues with 
with lie detector testing. So I'd actually ask Michael if you can think of a different example for your point here. Yeah. I would. Be yeah. Well, I I said that that was a, the crude beginning. That was the crude beginning of, of attempts to uh, to be able to to yeah. um, measure. But it was uh, unsuccessful, right? Okay, but, fine. Uh, but yeah. but I gave another example. Yeah. I gave other examples where where uh, other types of emotions and experiences can be viewed by neuroscientists on on a on their monitors so I, I don't have the you know specific cases of that right now but oh, I can I, I research give an that. example yeah give uh, an example. One would be yeah. like Neuralink where they're researching and they're able to kind of detect whether or not a monkey or a pig or whatever is in a certain state or performing a certain action but I think that's kind of um, not exactly what the paper is addressing or the argument is addressing. It's not yeah, that we can't. That, that actually, sorry, David, I think that actually leads into what D Nagel and Chalmers and people are talking about. But right. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think what they're saying is like, it's not that um, it can't be detected or it can't be, let's say like I have a super advanced thing that connects to your brain and it tells me like what you feel like sad, happy, mm -hmm what you're thinking, right? But even if I had all the facts about uh, how you feel or like, and what you're seeing and stuff like that, it doesn't really tell me what it's like to feel sad the same way that you do or to see the same way that you do or smell. Right, right David, no one's disputing that, but that doesn't prove that there's something non-physical happening. All it all it does is show that you, as the first person experiencer, have a different vocabulary to describe the same thing that a uh, third person or a second person can view on a test instrument. You have a, not just a different vocabulary, but you have a different experience of that same phenomena. It doesn't mean the phenomena is not physical. So when certain you know neurons fire in your brain. Or certain, you know, electromagnetic activity happens, or whatever. I don't really know much about neuro, uh, you know, neuroscience. Okay. When a certain physical process happens in your physical brain, you have a certain experience, and that's the qualitative experience that Nagel talks about, and no, no one disputes that. But it's a result of that, of those firings, of those neuron firings in your brain, and yeah. and, a, and a and a another person like a neurologist, a neuroscientist with an instrument hooked up to your brain could also see evidence of those same neurons firing. Now, obviously that neuroscientist couldn't experience your qualitative experience, but the source of both your qualitative experience, experience and the uh, result on the test, test instrument or on the screen, they're both a result of ex exactly the same physical and nothing more than physical phenomena. That's what the, that's what is the real representation of the physicalist theory here. Right. I would uh, I would add on that. I guess what we're we're not disputing that there are any non-physical origins or mm. any of these phenomena are non-physical. But I guess like the difference is like I can have all the physical facts and still there is something more to be known. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. My Zen are, are we what what my Zencaster cut out. It just like stopped recording. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Let me yeah. uh did it just do that just now? Yeah. yeah, like a minute ago. Okay, I'll I'll uh was it when I was talking or when I was done talking? It was like midway through when you were talking. Oh wow. Oh no. Let me start yeah. a new recording. Yeah, I did that uh... yeah, I got really confused. I was like, is it on my end? Oh uh, yeah, it? that's why I just sent my key message. I was like, I'm gonna start out. a I'm gonna start a new uh that's so weird. Okay, I'm Okay, I'm starting a new recording. Um Hello. I'm gonna recheck Reset settings. settings. I guess. Yeah, recheck okay. your settings. Okay. Yeah. I have a talking point to jump off of. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Let me just uh, hold on. Let me make sure it's working. Just, just a second. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, I'm good on my end. One, one second.
story about that one of my family members was knocking on my door. Uh, okay. Great timing, right? Oh, yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay, should I start recording again on Zencaster? I would yeah, say, like, yeah, try I to just... repeat your point, and then I'll, like, go into something. Because I, I have a one, two. Okay, okay, I'll repeat my point really briefly. Okay, hold on. Yeah, so just to reiterate, um, summarize my point, it, what I'm doing is I'm representing the, uh, a theory, one view of uh, physicalism, which does not deny qualitative experiences. It just states that uh, when a physical process happens in the in a brain uh, to the person whose brain it is, they are experiencing that physical process in one way, and the neuroscientist who's looking at a monitor who sees evidence of that same physical process is experiencing it in a different way, right, without the qualitative ex first person experience. But both the qualitative experience that the first person is having and the evidence of that neuron firing, for example, uh, which shows up on the neuroscientist, neuroscientist computer monitor, both of those experiences arise from exactly the same physiological process. There's nothing immaterial, there's nothing non-physical going on here. That's That was my point. Okay, thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to comment on your point here by actually giving a definition of the field of neuropsychology. Very briefly, the field of neuropsychology is the study of the relationship between behavior, emotion, cognition, and the brain function. So that is neuropsychology and, and neuroscience and all those things. I think neuropsychology is really where they're trying to get in to understand how, um, you know, brain states and specifically with, you know, neurons and brain structures relate to behavior and all those things. So one example, I remember, Michael, I, I stopped you earlier and I said, you know, that polygraph testing, lie detector tests weren't a great example for the point that you're trying to make. I think a better example for what you, the point you're trying to make, um, which relates to neuropsychology, is what they actually, what neuropsychologists try to do when they're trying to measure, you know, certain, uh, I guess, constructs, which which means things that, the constructs are things that are not, like things like love, uh, like in different types of emotions that can't really be defined in super objective terms. So they're given, you know, different binary, you know, things to try to like, to try to deconstruct what they what love is or for example like for love as a construct can be measured by you know your heart rate your skin temperature um you know a, a subjective rating scale for example that's kind of how psychologists try to measure constructs that are not actually you know like one thing like you know heart rate for example which is heart rate is kind of objective you kind of know what heart rate is um, with neuropsychology here, one example of like how they would try to understand um, a conscious or like experience that is subjective, let's say like IQ, for example, right? Only like one person really can ex even, ex I guess, experience their own IQ in a sense, which is kind of, a, it's kind of an odd example, but for the, for the sake of argument here, neuropsychologists use something called, there's different ways to measure IQ, but the most well-known one, I would say, is the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale. And that one is used, there's multiple tests inside that scale. Like, for example, um, one with how, like, how well you are inhibiting, like, different colors when you, like, see, when you see, like, red, blue, red, blue, and, like, it's hard to explain over um, in words, but um, they use different tests to try to, like, I guess, determine what these um, different experiences are in, like, in, in actual explainable terms. So that's, I guess, that's a better example that I would say for for your point, Michael. Thanks, Nicole. I think as as we end this discussion, I kind of it does make me think a little bit more about some later works, like I kind of said earlier to our, to our listeners. Um, one of the issues with the Nagel paper is quite short and he really doesn't discuss like too much where do we go from here. Um, and it does make me think a little bit about Chalmers and his more recent work um, where he talks about what, what, what are called easy and hard problems with consciousness. Now, to preface, he says that um, easy problems really aren't easy. They're problems about different, different brain states, 
Uh, for example, what is the brain doing when we're awake? What does it do while we're sleeping? How does it produce behavior? Um, brain monitoring, all that kind of brain body monitoring, all that kind of stuff. The hard problem, though, is basically a recontextualization of the objective subjective split. Uh, and what it means by that is basically how do the physical processes of, of the brain, which are obviously correlated with consciousness, I'm certainly not denying that, and, and I don't think anyone else who takes this really seriously does, how does that give rise to consciousness? And, and, and another way of stating that is why don't we just exist in the dark, right? Why don't our brain states just operate and function um, you know, uh, without any self-awareness? Where, where does that element come from? And then, and then on top of that, then, how do we get to that qualitative element of thing? And can we explain the qualitative element um, scientifically? Uh, the Chalmers thinks so, but he, but he it does have a caveat of basically saying that perhaps a new avenue of, um, or a new approach, a new avenue of sort of scientific reasoning is needed to actually get the subjective quality of experience of consciousness. Yeah, um, that sort of leads me to address one of Na uh, Nagel's assertions. Um, what does he call it? What pan panpsychism or something? Um, his assertion that, or suggestion that, uh, that if a brain has consciousness then all of its constituents must also have consciousness um because that's it's, correct right i yeah. you know I, I deny that and i think that that commits the logical fallacy of um a fallacy of composition which is that if uh if an entity has certain properties and therefore all of its constituents must have the same properties and i can give a you know a couple of quick examples of 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 how um that's fallacious so uh, one example would be uh, artwork. So you know, if you go to just, just for one second, though, I don't think Nagel actually makes uh -huh. a claim to panpsychism. Okay. Yeah. I, don't I, yeah. I think that he did. Well, one in the articles that I read about Nagel, I think he he might have done it in different papers or different articles, um, and a few videos that I watched about like his views, like did attribute panpsychism to him. They it might have been a really bad source. For example, mm -hmm. I. I don't, I don't know about that, but um, I did see panpsychism attributed to Nagel at certain oh. points. See, and when I when I read the first bit of the paper, it seemed as if he was saying that panpsychism was a bad idea. So, I don't... Mm -hmm. What I read was that he... It, it seemed that he didn't say that... He said that panpsychism wasn't the best idea, but was a better idea than the, uh, the uh, dominant idea at right. the time, which I think is non-panpsychism. This also leads into another little point about Nagel, which is like, I, I, I guess we'll say this. From the paper that we've read and from what I've read, Nagel, he doesn't, he doesn't suggest panpsychism is a, is a particularly good idea. Um, maybe he does somewhere else. He's, I think he's actually still alive. He's super old, but he's been writing for a long time. Um, and I think he's like in his 90s or like late 90s. Um, but he, it's an interesting point too, is, is a lot of times when we come to this discussion, we end up getting caught up and it talks about dualism as well. Well, Nagel and later on Chalmers and other are not particularly congenial to dualism. And the reason is that dualism, especially classical dualism, where you start to posit like the mind substance or the soul, if we get really traditional, um, those essentially move the problem somewhere else and say, okay, it's the pro, uh, um, consciousness is not physical, it's something else, it's just something else, now we can reduce consciousness or the qualitative experience to this other thing and we can understand that objectively in its, in, in, in its, um, in its aspects, which really doesn't ch change the issue, just as an aside, it's not really, it doesn't really do anything to make that move. Well, without um, addressing or arguing Nagel's position, let's let's make Nagel irrelevant for the moment. Let's talk about panpsychism. Panpsychism could be used by skeptics of materialism, or skeptics of physicalism. Panpsychism could be used as an absurdity to um, to refute physicalism in this way. Physical, physicalism postulates that if, if we have qualitative experiences, they 
uh, either can be reduced to or they emerge from, more likely they emerge from, vis physical constituents of the brain. But the skeptic of physicalism might say, well, it's absurd to think that, that um, like, atoms um, would have, could, could, you know, accumulate in the brain that, you know, matter, that, that elements, physical elements could accumulate, and suddenly, kaboom, consciousness happens. That's absurd. So therefore, um, each little atom and molecule must itself be conscious, which is also absurd, because it's absurd to say that, a, you know, like a speck of dust is conscious. So that, that, that argument could be used to actually refute physicalism. The absurdity of of, of um, panpsychism, but but so, that's wrong. But I just want to say that why that's wrong because we we witness every day how individual constituents don't have certain properties, but as a whole they do. Look at an artwork in a museum. You go to a museum and you look at a beautiful artwork, and you have this qualitative experience. You have an emotional experience. Well, you're having the emotional experience because of the sum total of the constituents of the artwork. You know, the canvas and the and the watercolor and all the different you know constituents. But each of those individually, if you if you looked at the canvas individually as a piece of canvas, it wouldn't create that same experience. So it's obvious that qualitative experiences occur as a result of the the conglomeration or the accumulation of or you know the composition of individual constituents. The individual constituents of which don't have the the um, the ability to give you that qualitative experience. So it makes total total sense actually. Physicalism makes total sense in that when you combine elements in a certain way, that new emergence happens, emergence of consciousness. Yeah. So Michael, to go on that point, um, thank you for giving that you know synopsis of panpsychism and how it relates to physicalism. Um, I read a bit about panpsychism relating to the Nagel paper and everything that are surrounding it. And I saw personally, like I, I saw, found a pretty plausible explanation for it that actually made sense to me, which just sounds super absurd because it seems like a really absurd viewpoint. But um, with, I saw the example of the human body, for example, right? So with the human body, you know, with phys physicalism, you know, it's postulated that you know, the brain is the center of conscious experience and how all these neurons fire together creates this, creates the outcome of conscious experience. Well, like, it's difficult to do, to give this explanation of panpsychism without anthropomorphizing the human body. But let me, hear me out for a second. When I was studying biology, going through school, going through elementary, high school and university, I, I took a f like several biology classes also at the university level. One thing that was really difficult for the professors and students not to do was to not anthropomorphize the human body. And what I mean by that is to say, oh, this cell wants to do this. This cell wants to bring this you know, thing over to here. This transporter is doing this for the purpose of that, right? Like it's, it, whenever, whenever we would give explanations of, you know, like some pro pro biological process, there would often be some sort of human characteristic attributed to the, you know, the process. Um, so like, oh, this transporter wants to transport this calcium over here. Like it was just, it was just a thing that we did, right? But if you, if I really think about it, right? Like if you go into each, each cell in the human body, each cell in the human body has a nucleus and it has all these processes of how it like governs itself and the nucleus is, stated to be the governing you know body of the cell and it gives all the instructions and all those things that in that's in a sense i i believe that that could be argued to have its own consciousness each cell in its way could have its own consciousness and that's and then the sum of all the cells you know make make a tissue and then tissues make organs and then organs all together you know make the human body right i think that's a, that could be a plausible explanation for panpsychism that would make sense to me Right, that each cell has its own consciousness and then it goes from that. I don't know if I could go deeper down at the molecular, molecular level and then say that you know each molecule has a consciousness. I'm not sure about that, but I could say at the cellular level that yes, there, there might very well be a consciousness there. I'm not sure, but it seems plausible to me. Hmm. I wonder if uh, a cell would even, maybe not conscious, but aware not aware of itself but not able to delineate itself from other things necessarily but simply just aware awareness of certain like 
this atom, these atoms are close. <clears throat> these atoms are not close. I'm kind of, or not I, but there is a lack of certain resources that we need for survival, I guess. I don't know, but that'd be interesting. And also, I would also, uh, to add on to Mikey's point, uh, panpsychism, panpsychism isn't necessarily contradictory to physicalism. I think if you simply take the assumption that all consciousness arises out of physical phenomena or like is purely a physical thing, then I mean, and uh, if, if you take the view that consciousness, like the functionalism view, where consciousness has a core function and there are many ways to implement this function doesn't always have to be a brain doesn't always have to be uh, through i guess like animal life could be through um computers or any any different implementation of this function could be considered consciousness but um essentially if consciousness is being implemented physically or if it's a function and it's being implemented in varying degrees then the argument for panpsychism could be made if we think of consciousness as like a sliding scale. I I think it's a mistake in response to what you guys were saying, Nicole and um David. Um, I think it's a mistake to impute uh, intent or consciousness to the functions of cells, for example. And here's why: because Darwinian evolution shows us that there's no consciousness or intent necessary for uh, for for a human body, for example, to develop in the way that it develops in order to work, in order to sustain life. Because those cells that don't perform in a way that sustains life, and those constituents of a human body that don't perform well to, say, a, a heart that doesn't perform well to pump blood, those will be deselected evolu in an ev evolutionary um, fashion. So only those elements only those life forms only those cells which are able to function in a way that sustains life will um, survive over time so it's a, it's a mistake then to look at what survives and say oh that cell works efficiently or that human heart works efficiently because it has some consciousness or intent to do so that's a mistake it's that those that didn't work efficiently were eliminated through the process of evolution I, uh, yeah, Mikey, I, I, I tend to agree with you on the discussion of, and I know at, when we discuss Nagel, one point he actually brings up, and when we get into this sort of discussion of consciousness, is he, is he uses the example of a bat to highlight a different type of consciousness because it's a mammal, it would seem to have some sort of experience. He, he says that's, that would seem likely. He does actually say that the farther you go down the chain, the, the simpler and simpler you get, um, it, it, it at least would seem the less and less likely there's some sort of um, awareness there, not perhaps certainly not self-awareness, but some sort of something it is like, quote unquote. Um, I think the other the other thing too is 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 that it's it's a natural human feature to see and interpret um, like phenomena with with our own like phenomena. What I mean by that is that certainly um, cells react; they have a they have a or, or cells or simple organisms or whatever you want to say, they have, they have patterns that to us look like the way we have patterns or other animals have patterns and certain features. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can infer that they have a, a, a mental structure that is, um, that is similar to, to our own. Um, they, as, as I know Chalmers kind of puts it, they probably very well do operate in the dark, as, as he would put it. And herein lies the, the question, right? We can what this discussion of co uh, consciousness presents, right, is, or demonstrates, right, when we talk about the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of consciousness, 
it shows an interesting philosophical shift, right? Of the need for everything to be scientifically provable and knowable. Right? But I like the fact that there might still be some mystery left in their lives um, to, 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 uh, to, to realize that whether we can say you have this experience because, you know, these neurons are firing or not, right? That's neat. But at the end of the day, I think that that devalues the actual experience. It, it devalues the impact human experiences have on the individual. So, like, if I give you a really emotional pep talk and you're, like, really jazzed for that football game, you're not going to be thinking, hmm, what neurons are firing right now? You're going to be just going for it because you're on, yeah, sure, uh, and, you know, a hormonal, <laughs> emotional high. Hey, you're assuming that sometimes I think about what neurons are firing. Well, I mean, that's that's another question, right? Like, who who actually, in their right mind, goes through life and is thinking, oh, uh, what exactly is happening in my brain right now? Like, how can I physically explain this? People who are interested in the brain, people who are studying neuropsychology like okay. myself. Yeah, but like, do you, but do you can't, do you consciously think about your consciousness? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> okay, well. I mean, yeah. I think it just depends on the person, right? Like if you're if you're in that field, I think of course you're gonna yeah. self-select and have that interest and do that yeah. on an occasion, right? Most people won't do that, right? But it's, it's I just wanna pull your leg a bit, Tegan. <laughs> uh, Nicole, my legs don't work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's fine. No, they work. They just don't fire neurons properly. That's all. Uh, so, yeah, but I I don't know. Maybe maybe it's because I'm like a romantic, you know, storytelling sap. But you know, which I am. I I, I enjoy I enjoy some mystery left in life. And I and I think like. Uh, in some ways, I'm kind of sympathetic to that to that view, in that um, again, I'll, I'll come back to Na to one of Nagel's points in the paper, which is simply that I think if we give it a, ch a, ch a relatively charitable reading, um, that maybe consciousness, the the purely subjective feature of what it is like to be someone or some kind type of mind. Um, again, not the correlating physical elements, but simply the, the experience itself, just isn't something that's particularly conducive to being explained in a scientific manner. And I, I would say that that's okay, right? Like we can, and, that, and that's not denying all the correlating or emergent effects of, 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 you know, essentially its origins and operations in the background. Um, but when it comes to the actual phenomena, um, it, it seems that it's it's perhaps okay to say that it's it's not this kind of thing that you can um, that you can that you can really understand in the traditional scientific sense, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that there is there there is just a a inherent subjective quality that makes it not really accessible in that way, and that perhaps leads into some other problems, right? Like are we are we all in a sense um, isolated from each other, right? And how can we communicate and stuff? And I think Nagel's comment to that and others is that it's more about the type of mind rather than particular minds, that we're all sufficiently similar, that we're able to use things like language and all its various forms and practices that we can kind of communicate on and with. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's kind of, I, th I think, I, uh, in some ways I'm a little bit charitable of that, but I certainly am not, um, Mystery is one thing, mysticism is another. I think it's what I would say. Mm. I, I would add on to your point and saying that uh, maybe one day physicalism and science, and we will get to the point where 
we know exactly all the physical facts about how consciousness arises and how it's made in the brain and how it works, but humans are incapable of experiencing what it's like to be a bat. Or maybe humans are incapable of experiencing what it's like to be something, you know? It's, it's kind of like in one of the videos, a lecture discussing this paper, right? The, the professor says, okay, imagine yourself as a rock. <laughs> imagine what it would be like to be a rock. You can't, there's nothing to being a rock because whatever you imagine, you're still going to imagine it as if you're looking at it as a human. So you're going to be like, Ooh, you know, it's kind of like you're in a dark movie theater alone. You know, you're still going to have all those sensory receptors, but a rock has none of that. A rock's just a rock. <laughs> and so it, you you can't understand what it is to be a rock because you're not a rock. You, you, you can't understand what it is to be a bat because you're not a bat. You, you can try and step into that a little bit, kind of like am in I have no mouth and I must scream right he tries to understand that to the best of his ability but he can't fully encounter it and and I think that's the difference right if and my my final question for Hale in particular is right how does this discussion have bearing on the value of those actual experiences like because should we take those like milestone experiences of like falling in love and stuff and like how should we respond to those if physicalism is correct because it seems to devalue the experience that's you know what i think Tay, again as, as we come to a close here that's that's a wonderful question and, and sometimes it's uh it's better to end with with uh more questions and answers I think it keeps it keeps yeah. us wondering, and it also uh, it also leads into the possibility of another show <laughs> that that we can discuss and our listeners can can kind of follow up on, right? What, what how does this impact how we actually experience, right? Is there perhaps um, you know a a science a a grounded scientific style phenomenology that we could use to actually talk about our experiences as they are being subjective, or is that just is that just encountering the same sorts of problems that we encountered before? But with that, we'll have to end the show today. Thank you for 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 joining everyone, and 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 thank you to our listeners who who uh, who listened. Um, it's been wonderful, and we'll see you next time. This was the Canadian Philosophy Show. Bye. Bye.